All right, so you guys hear me okay here? I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Does the audio sound good? Check, check. Yes, we can hear you. All right, great, thank you. Um, all right, um, only, only a few people here so far, um, but um, um, I guess we'll begin I mean, as usual. Feel free if you have questions to uh, unmic and Sam or, um, <clears throat> or chat them out in the chat box. So, um, oh, um, let's see here. I'm basically planning on going over the uh, materials from chapter four here today. Um, and, uh, let's see if I can get in here. All right. Uh, so yeah, so basically this week we're looking at um, kind of continuing on chapter four from our textbook. So the unit, unit six um, is really about um, the second half of the chapter four where uh, from our hands-on machine learning textbook where we go into uh, more details about how um, regression, uh, linear regression works or actually polynomial regression. So, um, and then we look at uh, the issues of regularization here. So I thought I'd talk about that. Um, yeah, so, and then maybe later, um, I can also uh, uh, look at the assignment three here, see if there's any questions on that as well. So actually, I don't know what to do first. Um, um, let, me, let me talk about the materials for this week first um, and try and keep it a bit short. We'll see. Um, and then, um, but I'll, I'll leave some time then so I can bring up the third assignment and talk about that. So that is due uh, at the end of this week. Um, I did finally get back the, the feedback uh, evaluations for the second assignment. Um, took me a bit of time, so, uh, but those should be available now. Um, and, oh yeah, and we already talked about that last week and I posted an example solution. So um, people can, uh, should be able to get the stuff from the second assignment if you need it. So, Let me, I'm going to get my dev box started up here. Let me check, I started my recording here. Uh, yeah, okay, so I think we're good. So, as usual, we'll let the virtual machine come up here. Um, you should be looking that you've got your port forwarded so you can get to the Jupyter Hub server on there and that you have your shared folders mounted. And, um, try that again. So then we should be able to go to the port to the IP 127.001 on the local host to the port 8000. Um, get into our Jupyter Hub here. So. All right. Um, so I'd ask you to concentrate on the 4-3 um, uh, and the 4-4 um, notebooks on this unit here. So that's from chapter four. Um, so last week we talked a little bit about the first half of chapter four. So the basic introduction to linear regression and then gradient descent. Um, so I hope everybody, you know, um, 
um, got a good handle on on that material. So, um, uh, because it'll be useful for you for understanding kind of in general how machine learning works. So, um, um, uh, all the different sorts of methods that we'll be kind of using in this class, uh, a lot of them anyway, um, use similar kinds of ideas of setting up things as an optimization problem um, and then having some sort of a fitness function or a, or a class function um, and uh, using that to uh, you know, find a model. So to optimize, so you minimize your, your cost function. Um, So let's look at um, polynomial regression then. So um, if you go through this notebook and, and the second half of chapter four, um, you'll get um, kind of a much better understanding, I, I believe, about kind of how regression is working uh, in general. Okay, so you know, fitting. Um, something more than a line. So um, instead of doing linear regression, so, so fitting something more complex, a more complex function, um, like a general polynomial, um, the, uh, the the method is still the same as linear regression. Um, and, and in fact, we, you know, we'll come down to here in this notebook, uh, we can actually use the, the linear regression um, instances from, um, um, from our scikit-learn library, right? So if you just fit, if you feed in non-polynomial, or so um, um, uh, if you feed in, feed in parameters that have uh, non-linear relationships, you know, like, like, a, like a polynomial like we do here, um, it can still fit, um, you know, using the same cost function and the same basic idea um, uh, to, to function like that. So, so as usual, probably, you know, uh, working through these examples um, might make it clearer than, than uh, trying to kind of discuss or explain things. So, um, so I assume, you know, when I say polynomial, people uh, kind of know what I mean by that. So a, a general polynomial is, is, is a function of one variable, but where you'll have uh, powers of that variable, okay? So, you know, x, x squared. So, so this is a, a polynomial degree um, two here. This is really x squared, uh, x to the first, and x to the zero power here, right? Um, so, so yeah, you can think of the 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 constant, the bias term, as being multiplied times you know, x to the zero, um, or you know, kind of a redundant parameter. Um, but you know, you can have higher degree polynomials. So you can have uh, third degree with uh, cubics, fourth degree, or, 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 or higher than that, right? Um, so what I mean by this, so, so anything that's, that's a, a second degree polynomial is going to be a, uh, known, also known as a quadratic. Um, so that'll make a, uh, you know, like a, a parabola. Um, so it's, it's not linear, it's, it's a nonlinear relationship. Um, and um, so if, if we plot this with the, the true, um, values of this polynomial where we use one half for our x squared parameter and three fourths for our x and then three for the um, um the bias term here um, actually looks like this the red line here okay so what we're doing here is is we're, we're making up data in order to illustrate points in in all these notebooks um so you know when, when you get data from a real experiment it, it's going to have noise um, from various um, sources. Um, you know, so you can't really uh, avoid that. So when, when you collect data, um, um, noise of some kind is going to get in there. So we're simulating that uh, in these examples by adding in some random uh, Gaussian noise, right? So, so Gaussian, uh, the same as a normal distribution. Um, so, you know, we generate 100 points at random or however many points we generated here uh, and, and added a bit of noise so it would be above or below the true value of the function, right? And then, you know, so we're, we're going to illustrate what happens if you fit a, a regression uh, to these points. You fit a polynomial regression to these blue points. Um, 
uh, here, right? So the, the, you know, the thing we're trying to do is we're trying to, if we didn't know what these parameters were, if we only knew that, or if we were guessing that um, maybe it was a quadratic function that's governing um, the, uh, the data that we're trying to model here. So, so um, um, given that, that we think it's a quadratic function, uh, what we want to do is estimate these parameters. So the parameter for the x squared term, for the x to the power of one term, and for the x to the power of zero term, um, um, by fitting a regression to these uh, to the data points that we have. Right? And you know, so for real data analytics or real machine learning, of course, you don't know what what these two parameters might be that are dri driving your model. Uh, you don't even know if your model, you know, is is maybe linear or nonlinear, um, right? So, so you don't even know the, the true kind of um, um, form of your model. So those are both things that you have to uh, either make hypotheses, you know, you have to make hypotheses about and try and test those. So try and fit different models, like a linear model or a quadratic model or, or other things, um, and see which works best. Um, and you know, and we also have to fit and try to estimate these parameters once we decide on the form of, of the model that, that we're going to try and fit with some data. Um, so anyway, if, if you saw blue points like this, I mean, it would be um, pretty obvious that this is not linear, right? So, so you know, most data science looking at this right away would say, I mean, it's, it's definitely not a good linear. A model, so, so there has to be something, uh, some sort of nonlinear relationship, you know, that, that seems to make it higher for these values of x, and then goes down, and then um, and then higher for these, right? Well, and notice on this that we're only plotting uh, the values of x, but um, but of course we get this nonlinear relationship because we have powers of, of x and x squared uh, in here that, that we're adding together for the, for the polynomial. Um, So the polycyclic function, um, the, the, the name might make more sense now. Um, if you go read the documentation for, for polyfit, um, um, the, the documentation for it might make more sense now after you read our, this material on uh, polynomial regressions. Um, so, um, So for example, um, I mean, the, the polyfit function basically from NumPy is doing at least squares fit, which you should kind of know what that is now. So we talked about the, the, the fitness function, the, uh, the root mean squared error um, is basically when we optimize that, we're trying to find the one that gives the smallest value for that, uh, the root mean squared error. So that's a least squared fit, right? Um, but in this case, the, the polyfit can fit um, um, some fine fit data of um, um, you know not only just a, a degree one, which is a linear. Um, so you can think of that as, as a polynomial of degree one, which just has an x to the power of one term. That can you know it can fit uh, x squared, x cubed, or higher polynomial to any data or prior to using the, the least squared um, cost function. Right? Um, so as we set it up here, you know, the polyfit, um, it expects um, if you ask for a degree two polynomial, you should have uh, uh, an, an X, which is the inputs that has two um, parameters only. Um, so um, in this case, our X array, um, if we didn't display it here, if I didn't, um, um, So 
So, oh no, I'm wrong. So, so yeah, the X um, only has um, a one column. So, so yeah, I'm wrong about that. Um, but yeah, so in this case, X is just going to be um, the, the values that we're doing our range of our function over. So negative three to three in this case. Um, um, but chosen um, um, at random in this case for our um, um, for our example here. So. Um, Hopefully everybody, you know, kind of figured out like what these do. I hope everybody is, you know, you know, not just reading this code, but actually executing it and uh, trying to make certain that before you go past things like this, that you understand um, what's being done and, and how things work here. So in this case, you know, we're using the RAND function from um, the NumPy library. Um, M means that we're going to generate 100 random points. Um, these would generate random points um, on a normal distribution. So with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Um, and so by multiplying by six, that changes the range to go from negative six to positive six. Uh, instead of from you know instead of having a standard devi standard deviation of negative one to one or, or a standard deviation of one um, this expands that to have a kind of standard deviation of six and then when we subtract three that um, um, shifts it um, Um, oh, the, the, the RAND isn't a normal distribution, so it gives numbers in the range from zero to one, right? So yeah, so multiplying by six, we get values from zero to six, and then we shift them down to go from negative three to three there. So, um, anyway, back to polyfit. Um, So, you know, basically what it's doing is if you invoke it correctly, um, you know, so if we're asking it to fit a degree two polynomial using the, you know, a least squares fit, it's going to give estimates for the parameters A, B, and C. So these will be the parameters that uh, minimize the, 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 the mean squared um, um, cost function. Um, for the data that we feed in, right? So it'll, it'll minimize that. So, so we're trying to predict Y from our uh, set of value X uh, given in X here, right? So in this case, you know, you'll see, you know, basically A, B, C correspond to the, you know, the, the first one is the X squared term. The second one is the uh, X to the power of one term. And the third one is the X to the power of zero term, right? And, and, you know, it's pretty good. So, and, and of course, you know, another thing you should understand is you can't expect to get exactly the correct parameters because there's noise in here, right? So, so you can't recover the exact true function when you add noise here because of the, the, the random variation of the noise that was added, uh, the, the true function has been lost, um, at least uh, trying to recover it from the data alone, right? Um, so this is just an approximation, um, and we'll know that it won't be perfect, but um, um, it will have some relationship, hopefully, um, to the um, data that we're fitting. You know, you know. The, the biggest problem with polyfit is, of course, if you, if you don't know what the true function is. Um, so, so if this if this was a you know a, a power of four um, function or, or something higher like that, um, then we we might get some parameters, but they might not be a real great fit if, if we're not getting the, um, the, the polynomial, um, you know, the, the form of the function uh, very good um, that we're trying to model. As you can see here, so the, you know, the X squared term was one half, was pretty close, and, and it was three fourths for the X to the power one and three for the, um, um, and, and then you can see, so kind of visually, so, so if we plot you know, the true function and our fitted polynomial, we'll see the, the polyfit did quite well, right? So yeah, pretty close to the true function. Um, and, um, you know, so you can understand what polyfit 
is doing, or now you should be able to understand what polyfit is doing because this is basically doing a least squared uh, regression fit like we discussed uh, last week. And, and you should have uh, gone through on the uh, 4-1. Um, and it, and it um, the, I'm not certain that the, the polyfit function might be using a um, um, exact uh, function that we briefly discussed uh, last, last time. Um, I'm not certain if it does that or if it, or if it uses optimization, uh, but we can use like scikit-learn linear regression, which does use you know optimization like like a, a gradient descent, um, like we talked a little bit about last time. You should have learned a bit about. Um, 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 but although in this case, so so to use. Um, linear regression, like we're going to show you here. Um, so, I mean, as you can see, it might, that this, this might be misnamed a little bit, right? So it, it's really a least squared regression. So linear regression in general is just doing a least squared fit. Um, you know, like we were just talking about for, for polynomial fit, right? But, uh, but in this case, to, to pass this, um, if we want to do um, a, um, a fit on a two degree polynomial, uh, for linear regression, we have to pass in, uh, you know, we, we have to pass in the um, um, uh, um, x1 and x2 and, and x0 um, value, right? Um, or, you know, like, like we talked about um, before, um, actually, we just have to have the two parameters, the x1 and the x2, um, the, uh, the, the Scikit learn adds in the dummy column, which, which would um, correspond to the x0 parameters here, unlike stats model, where you do have to add in that, that parameter by hand, right? But, but what we're doing here, if we're, if we're fitting a polynomial, is, is we're going to just use the same uh, x terms like, like we did um, up above here, but we add a second column, um, which, is, which will be our second parameter x2 here, but that'll be the square of these terms, right? So, so we'll just we'll just pass in um, the, 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 the power of one terms or, or just the x values, and then we'll pass in the square of the values as our second column, right? Um, and and the, the, the linear regression then um, from scikit-learn, we'll just treat those as two separate um, parameters, and we'll try to fit what we're now calling the theta parameters instead of ABC, so polyfit, um, if you work with polynomials, they usually use, you know, like AX squared plus BX plus C is kind of the convention. Uh, but here, when we're talking about um, in the context of machine learning, you know, we often use um, theta, um, um, you know, theta zero, theta one, theta two, you know, and then if we have higher term or more um, terms, theta three, theta four, and so on, right? Um, So anyway, we do have to kind of create the X, um, um, uh, you know, so we have to have uh, an array of our original X's and the square of the value, and we could easily do that by hand, but um, um, scikit-learn has a, a function called polynomial features, right? So, um, I mean, you know, I, I, in this particular case, we could have done this pretty easily by hand, um, um, uh, create the, the array X that we needed. Um, So, um, 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 X has you know a thousand or ten thousand points, um, but but it's one dimensional. So, um, um, and the first five points look something like um, um, this here. Um, oh, right. it, it's one dimensional. So the first five points look something like this. So, so these are just values that range from negative three to three, right? Um, so using vectorized calculations, you know, we, we could always square these, right? Um, so that would be the, the squares of the um, first five values in X. Um, and we could do that basically and some other NumPy methods to um, um, 
create a new matrix uh, that has two columns instead of a one um, um, that, you know, where the first column is the, the original axis, and then we join that with the second squares of the axis, right? Um, so we're doing something similar by using polynomial features here. Um, it'll do it for you. So if you ask for, you know, degree two, it'll create all of the, um, um, all the parameters that you pass in for the X when you do the fit transform, um, it will um, um, create the, the second degree uh, and add the second degree of each one of them. So in this case, we've only got one parameter. So we'll end up with our original one parameter um, and um, the, um, the, the square is our second column over here. Right? Um, and if that was all that polynomial features did, you know, we really wouldn't need it, but it's much more powerful than that. So I think we described later on. Um, I mean, you know, obviously you can do like degree three, degree four, but also you can pass in um, a, an original X that has um, more than uh, one column. Um, you know, more than one feature. And in that case, it will not only give you, you know, the, the square and the cube of, um, you know, the, the two features A and B, but, um, but you'll get all the, the combinations that are degree three combinations. So, so you know, AB, A squared B, AB squared, um, and, and so on. Um, All right, anyway, so um, I kind of skipped over, but, um, you know, so fitting this data, um, we should get up exactly the same uh, result that we had with the polyfit because they're both doing at least squared um, regression here. Um, so, so given the same data, um, although, you know, our, our parameters are, aren't quite in the same order. So these are gonna be the, the values of the two, you know, A and B of our first two coefficients. So that's the, uh, the, the x squared parameter um, and then the x parameter. So, you know, um, or, or no, I got that. So that's the x squared parameter because the x squared ended up being the, um, the second column here. So we have one half times the x squared. So that, that's the, the theta one um, and then, uh, or the theta two. Um, the theta one was the three fourths. So that was our um, fit for the three fourths. Um, and then the, um, uh, the intercept term is going to be our bias term or the um, uh, the, the constant term, you know, 3.12 here. So. Um, so yeah, since since we regenerate random data every time when we do this, uh, the numbers here will be different, a little bit different from what I had on here. But but these numbers, since I'm, I'm creating the linear regression fit um, on the same data that we created the, the poly fit, should exactly match the values that we got up here in cell six um, um, for this set of random uh, points that's governed by this quadratic function here. So, um, and it looks like they do, right? So, um, All right, so hopefully that that um, that that makes sense, right? So we're we're just generalizing exactly what we learned um, last week. Uh, so in our last two lecture notebooks, um, so we, we are fitting a model um, of in this case two parameters, and then you know our bias term or our constant term. Um, so we've actually got three parameters, right? But in this case, we've really only got one value of X, um, but we're using polynomial combinations of that X. So X to the power of zero, X to the power of one, and, and X to the power of two, or X squared, right? But the, 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 the least squared fit still works fine to estimate the theta zero, theta one, and theta two. Um, and, um, and, um, and yeah, we get this, um, this estimate, basically, the, the dotted blue line here, um, using both polyfit and uh, the scikit learn. So. Um, so 
So the second part of this first notebook, um, we talked a little bit about learning curves, right? So um, this is all about, you know, how do you know whether the model you chose is correct and, and how, how do you know how well your model is doing uh, when, when you fit a model to data like this? So, so there's several kind of sources of, of, of errors or, or problems that can arise, right? So, so again, in the, you know, if you're doing real data analytics, you don't know, I mean, you, you not only don't know the, the values of the parameters, theta one, theta two, theta three, but you don't even know the, the true form of the function. You know, is it linear? Is it nonlinear? If it's nonlinear, um, what are the um, relationships between the feature or the features that we have um, that, that create the, the nonlinear interactions between the features and so on. Um, so So, um, don't know why we had the error there. Very running again. Yes, and run the cells all all the ones up above that here. So. So um, I guess um, might have been error in the notebook here. So we're missing the, um, I accidentally delete it here. So um, um, we're supposed to be demonstrating um, the um, various fits. So like a, 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 um, a linear fit. Um, In that notebook, maybe I accidentally deleted that one. I wasn't uh, paying attention there. So, I must have deleted that cell there when I wasn't uh, when I wasn't looking there. So okay. So um,
so there, there's some sense this is this this part right here at, at the start of learning curves is trying to illustrate um, what we mean by a good model or a good uh, model that fits the data well right so I mean there's no doubt um, um, so in this case we can create um, um, basically the same kind of set of data that we were using uh, above I think we modified it a little bit um, so we're using um, uh, one half x squared plus, I guess we are using the same uh, target data again here. Although I guess we made the range a little bit different, just from negative one to one uh, in this case here. Um, yeah, my, my, my comment is a little bit incorrect there. So we changed the, the range to be from negative one to one. Um, so, So we know this data is still quadratic. So, so um, it was actually uh, an x squared uh, function, right? Um, now, if, if we fit like a line, so the red one is fitting a degree one or a linear fit, so that's a, a regular linear regression. Um, but then we fit a degree two polynomial um, using scikit-learn's um, um, linear regression again. And we fit a, um, a degree 300 polynomial. Okay, so notice that um, um, in this case, um, um, yeah, we created, we used the polynomial features. This would be something that you wouldn't want to try and do by hand, right? But, but the polynomial features can easily take, um, you know, our original X and then return back um, a new array. So now X is, has for the degree 300 actually has, you know, 301 columns, so the original X you know, and then the x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, all the way up to the x to the 300th power here. So, so the shape is actually um, 300, right? Because it has x to the power one up to x to the power 300 uh, terms now. Um, so we can fit, you know, the, the x cubed. And if, if you look at the, the, the the resulting uh, uh, mean squared error for all three of those. Um, I don't know if we displayed those or not down here, uh, but but if, if if we did, so if we if we printed out the the, the mean squared errors, so so the final um, 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 fits that we have for these, the the degrees. 300 polynomial would by far have the the smallest of the uh, the, 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 the the mean squared error among these three, right? So that does that mean that the degree 300 um, fit is the best model since it ended up with the smallest um, um, mean squared error uh, when we fed to the data, right? Um, and and you know you should understand why that's true because uh, well, the other, by having um, 300 degrees of freedom, um, our fit here is actually able to go through mit, much more of the points um, um, than the linear or the, the quadratic models that we have here. And so it's able to get much closer to all, all the points. Um, thus, it has a, a lot smaller of an error, right? But, you know, what you should know, though, I mean, you know, already before uh, reading through the rest of the, um, the notebook here is that, um, I mean, the, the, the data is actually quadratic. It's quadratic with some noise in there, but, but you know, the, the best models um, are really going to be quadratic um, um, because we happen to know what the true form of the data is that's generate that's generating our points that we're trying to model here right so you, we really couldn't do any better than a quadratic model right so so you know so so the the um the cost doesn't tell you which model is best so so the final uh, mean squared error um that you would get from fitting models um, isn't going to tell you which is the best model because if you just go by that the degree 300 model is gonna be much better than the other two. We have a much lower final cost here, right? So, um, 
Um, so what we really want to do is we want to know how well the, the model, um, we want to be able to measure how the, well the model generalizes um, as performance, right? Um, so, okay, yeah, so we throw some terms out here. So um, um, this is an example of overfitting, right? So the very high degree polynomial that we fit here uh, ends up going through a lot of these points, but it's really just modeling the noise, right? And the noise is random. So, so even though it, it, it can try and fit well, you know, it can try and wiggle and, and get close to or go through as many points as possible, that's it's just going through the, um, the noise that we had by chance that, that we added um, to this data when we, when we created this artificial data set, right? Um, so, you know, if we generate a second set of data points that we don't, that we didn't use to fit this model to it using the same function, the same underlying function, but, you know, a different random noise that comes in, um, it, it's, um, cost would, would drastically, uh, you know, it, it would um, um, go down a lot in that case. So it would, be do, it would do very bad on if we gave it another set of points that we didn't train it with uh, for, that were generated from the same underlying function and the same amount of noise, uh, but, but um, um, you would get a different actual um, set of noisy values here, right? And, and so uh, all the wiggles that it made to um, get as close as, as it could to the data that we fit with would, would end up ma making very bad predictions on a different set of data that it hasn't seen before, right? So that's the essence of overfitting. Whereas the, um, the, the linear and the quadratic models wouldn't be affected nearly as much. So, so they would, they would uh, their costs um, on data that they, that was generated with the same model, but that they weren't fit with or trained with would be about the same as it was for these, these data points that we actually fit um, our linear and our, our um, quadratic model to, right? Um, so, but um, the, in this case, um, the, the, the linear model is actually underfitting, okay? So the linear model is gonna have, uh, um, not as good of a mean squared error as the, the quadratic model, because we're trying to fit a line to this data that has a little bit of a curve of, of a nonlinearity to it. So uh, um, um, the, 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 the linear model is an example of an underfitting model here. Um, and that comes about because, you know, we're not using a powerful enough fundamental model. You know, the data is nonlinear, um, so we need a nonlinear model to, to correctly model that and predict um, uh, those nonlinearities that we have in here. Um, all right, so, so the question becomes, you know, how can we detect overfitting and underfitting? Um, and, and how can we determine whether our models are able to generalize well or not? So, and that's where learning curves comes in and where doing, um, um, you know, train test splitting or, or, or uh, doing cross validation comes in. Both of those are, are ways of, of making some determination of whether you're underfitting or overfitting and, and how well your model is gonna be, is, is able to do to generalize to data that it hasn't seen before, that it wasn't uh, trained with, right? Um, Okay. There's um, 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 a slightly different way that, that we'll normally be doing um, like uh, train test splits and, and plotting the, the data here. Uh, but in this case, um, what we do is um, we train a model on only a subset uh, of the data. So, so we, we actually have like a thousand points in this training set. So we train it on like one point down here at the extreme and then we uh, test it, validate it 
um, on the remaining points here. Um, Um, or, uh, um, so that's not quite right. So, so yeah, we are actually uh, pulling out 20% of the data. Um, so, so all of the the uh, evaluation of the blue curves comes from the 20% that, that we never train with. Um, but uh, yeah, and then in this case, um, though we, we do we, we do we train a model with just one data point, kind of selected at uh, at uh, random here. Um, so in this curve, uh, we're actually fitting a model. Um, uh, on the data just up to the nth point where we start at for m is one. So, so the first time through this loop, uh, we're, we're, we're just training a model with just a single data point. Um, and as, as you can imagine, you know, fitting uh, on just a single data point, um, your, your cost function will be perfect. Um, um, you know, the, the root mean squared error will be perfect just on, on a single data point or two data points because I can fit like a line or a uh, or any kind of a curve, quadratic curve that will exactly go through those um, um, two points um, if I have a degree one or a degree two polynomial. Um, but um, as you add more and more points, um, your, your mean squared error will get uh, worse and worse um, on the training data, right? So once you get, if we're fitting a linear model, um, um, so, so in this case, we are fitting, um, this is a, a, a degree one polynomial, so we are doing an actual linear regression. Um, 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 in this first set of data points. So, so this was our example of underfitting here, right? Um, so eventually, once you use enough points, um, we'll, we'll see that um, for undermining, these are examples of learning curve here. So, so at some point, the, 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 the performance on the validation plotting the root mean squared error becomes you know, about the same as the, the, the performance on the data that we trained with. Right. So, so it's doing just as well on the data that um, it hasn't seen um, as it's doing on the data that we use to fit the model with. Once we get up past 100, um, you know, using the 100 points or so. Right. But the root, the, the, the error, the, the, the root mean square error that we're achieving is about I don't know, 0.18 or so on, on the validation and the train. Um, so I've already told you. I mean, this model is underfitting. Um, um, so uh, what you'll what you'll see for underfitting models, if you plot learning curves like this, is that um, um, when they come together like this, uh, either you're underfitting or um, or you might have a good model. So so the the the, the way to differentiate that though is you have to uh, maybe look at a model that's overfitting and see how well your um, uh, the, the, the the root mean square error on the train error on the train data can get um, when you're overfitting a bit, right? So we'll see what we mean by that in a second. Um, so um, for a model that's overfitting, um, what you'll typically see for learning curves like this um, is that um, the um, validation data. I mean, again, you can think of the validation uh, performance as a measure of how well you're generalizing, how well the model is generalized, right? So eventually these do kind of almost come uh, back together here, um, but um, 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 for, for a large range, there's, there's a much bigger um, difference. And in fact, we cut it off here. So it's, it's really a lot bigger than that until we get down here to, you know, using uh, 400 of our data points. For the, the training set side, right? So when you see a big gap between the validation and the train uh, data, um, that's an indication that overfitting might be occurring. So, so you know, you're, you're, you're learning really well the data you're training with and getting small root mean squared error, so, so, so small cost function, but it's, it's not generalizing on, on unseen data, right? So, so the, the model is probably overfitting. 
The other thing you can see, what, what I was talking about, is that um, the, the kind of performance that you expect is that a, a good model that's generalizing well and, and is not overfitting ought to be able to maybe get close to what you would see uh, for the um, uh, model when you're overfitting it. Um, so, so like a root mean square error of about 0.1 here is something that we want to try and um, shoot for basically um, on a model. But, 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 but this is probably evidence that, I mean, this is evidence that um, this model is too powerful. So, so it, it overfits badly and which points the, um, um, the, the generalization behavior for a large range of the values here, right? But what you'll see for a good model um, um, that's neither overfitting or, and, or underfitting is that uh, um, you won't see, um, you know, so much more quickly um, um, the, the validation and the training performance should be about the same. Right, um, as we see here. So this, this is where we're, we're fitting the quadratic model um, here in this training curve, right? Um, so, so much more quickly, again, like for the underfitting, um, 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 we're getting about the same performance, both on the validation data and the original training data on our cost function. But here, both of these are around the, the 0 0.10, right? So about the performance that we saw that we could get when we were overfitting. But we're getting that um, on the validation data. We're getting that real quickly um, uh, on small training set size, right? So this is evidence that um, that our model our, our model is of, of the right power. So so a quadratic model generalizes pretty well, um, and um, 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 you know, from this learning curve, we can see that that it generalizes and it doesn't need a whole lot of data to get to that good kind of generalization um, performance, you know, to be, be matching what we see on the performance, even with the data that we trained the model with. Um, all right, and then uh, as final thing here, our textbook talks about uh, these terms, bias versus uh, variance. Uh, so, so bias is really um, because you're choosing the wrong model, either one that's too powerful, um, so it'll be prone to overfitting, like the 300 degree polynomial model here, or one that's not powerful enough. Um, so, right, so like assuming a linear, or using a linear model when we've got the, the actual true function governing the data um, has some nonlinearities to it, you know, it's quadratic or maybe even. Um, even more nonlinear. Um, so and variance. Oh, so, so I misstated that a little bit. So, um, um, so, so bias. Yeah, you can. It's better to think of that as the um, um, the part that's coming about from using um, not a powerful enough model. Um, so, so th this will be stuff that will push you to underfit. So like using a linear model when you have a, some nonlinear um, data that you're trying to uh, create a model of. Um, and um, variance um, um, is um, where you're overfitting. So if, you're, if your model is too powerful, um, it starts fitting um, some of the noise uh, in, instead of um, just fitting the actual relationships so that it can generalize well. So. So yeah, so, so like a, you know, um, if, if we're using way too high of a degree of a polynomial, um, in this case, um, we'll, we'll have high variance, right? Um, so those, those are two sources of errors that you try and uh, reduce when you're trying to build a model, right? And you will usually reduce those in machine learning uh, by doing things like this, but by doing train test splits um, and then looking at things like learning curves um, to try and, figure out, am I underfitting or, or am I overfitting or do I seem to be doing, you know, just right, kind of in between. Uh, and, but, but there's always going to be some error, you know, that's irreducible, right? So, so you know, we've seen, we've seen that, right? Um, so um, the, the true value of, of 
um, all these functions um, was given like by the red line, but you know we're, we are simulating that uh, you know when we're measuring this data, something is happening in the measurements that adds some random noise to that, right? So we'll never be able to get a root mean squared error of zero, even if we have exactly the right model, a degree two polynomial, um, because we can't completely um, reduce that irreducible error, right? So, so we've lost that information about the, the true nature of this from this noise error. And you know, you'll never get, you'll always have some irreducible error, some noise in your measurement. Um, although, you know, that's that's kind of another topic um, in um, in um, uh, experimental design. So, so when you are collecting data, you want to try and do things to, to reduce that error for you know, that, that noise in, in the data that you collect. But you'll always have some. Um, All right, that's a good place for break. Anybody have any kind of quick questions on those things? I, think I might take five minutes here, um, and then we'll go through maybe a little bit quicker the uh, the regularization, um, and then we'll we'll talk about the third time here. So, um, but yeah, let's, let's come back at about uh, five thirty-five here. All right. Okay, there, I think I'm back recording. Um, all right, so let's continue on here. Um, so let's, um, like I said, I probably won't spend quite as much time um, on the regularization here. Um, so. So regularization for machine learning models is another way of, of trying to get the best balance between bias and variance. So, so regularizing models is a common thing to do uh, because you don't, again, you know, for real data, you don't know the form of the function you're trying to model. Um, and um, um, you have to use tools like um, uh, the learning curves and, um, um, and, and examining the, uh, the, the results from um, uh, on your validation data and, and your test and train data uh, to try and determine whether you know, you're underfitting or overfitting or not or doing well. Um, so regularization helps you, especially it helps you with the, um, um, uh, the variance uh, kinds of issues, so, so overfitting issues. Um, so by adding in regularization, um, um, even if your model is kind of overpowered, um, you can force it to um, um, reduce or remove some of those unneeded, um, like uh, higher dimensional, uh, you know, high, higher powers, like if you're doing a polynomial fit, right? So. Um, If I can go back real quickly um, and bring up the um, the form of our cost function, our root mean squared error cost function that we had given. Uh, what was the final? Was that the final one? That was the final one. So. Um, So this describes the the the, the mean squared error um, cost function that we are you know going to be using a lot um, that, that we use for, for lots of machine learning models, right? So so this is um, form the calculation that uh, basically you know when we sum up the the squared differences between our model's prediction and the true value um, gives us some idea of. of how well our model is doing overall in predicting on, on the data, the end data points that we're using to, to try and fit our model or train our model in, right? So when we used uh, regularization, 
um, like the, the, the rig regularization or the lasso regularization. What we're doing is we're gonna be adding in a penalty. Um, 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 so basically this is the same mean squared error um, um, and this is parameterized on the, the, the values of theta. Um, so basically here, because we're computing the, the model, you know, y hat is the, the, the model. So, so that is in relationship to some partic particular set of, of, of theta values. So, so the, the parameters that we're trying to fit here, and, and we're trying to then calculate the, the mean squared error or the cost for some particular uh, theta parameters, all right? So, so, so this is, this is uh, the mean squared error is for, um, um, you know, so if we can optimize this, um, um, so, so do a gradient descent or some sort of optimization method to find the, 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 the least of this uh, squared error, um, then that gives us good values of, of theta, right? But um, those values of theta, um, you know, like, like we just saw, um, if we're overfitting, um, the problem is, is that, um, like, you know, think of the degree 300 polynomial function. Uh, in that case, we're using, um, um, if we were fitting that, and the true model was actually just a degree two polynomial, we're using, you know, the x cubed, x to the fourth, you know, x to the 300 power, all of those, um, we're actually um, getting values for the parameter from the, the least squared uh, error when we fit our function, right? So a simple thing you can do, um, this is called ridge re regression or um, L1 regression here. Um, so we can just add a penalty, all right? So the bigger that, um, so, so here, these are those state of parameters and the bigger these are, the, big, the bigger the regularization penalty is gonna be, okay? So, so you know, if you understand nothing else about this, what this does is um, this tends to try to drive um, these parameters to become small or to, or to become zero, right? So, so the parameters that you're trying to fit, the theta parameters, if you add in this regularization, this, uh, this ridge um, um, regularization term, um, this will make the cost function be bigger if those theta parameters are big, right? Um, and the cost, and correspondingly, the, the cost function will be smaller um, if, if those parameters are all small, right? So the effect of that is it, it, it tends to reduce overfitting, right? So it tends to favor models where you can like, for example, uh, if I can have a model that um, can have the value be zero for a lot of those parameters, like, you know, and we don't really need like the X cubed, X to the fourth, X to the fifth to have a good model. Um, in our previous examples, if, if the true model was only a, a quadratic function, right? So if, if, if these can, this can have a effect to try to drive those down to become small or zero, right? Um, which will um, keep the model from overfitting um, so much and um, uh, will in theory and in practice um, allow it to generalize better, right? So for this uh, regularization term, um, so normally we have another parameter called alpha, right? So alpha can be a value from zero to, um, 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 well, whatever value you want, big value, right? So if alpha is zero, that means that the, 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 the sum of the, um, um, of the weights, or, no, we are squaring the weights, but again, in, in um, our linear models, those parameters can be negative or positive. Um, so, you know, in order for this to be a penalty, um, again, we, you know, we want to do something so that we have the magnitude. Um, the same thing when we were taking the difference of the values and squaring it, when we talked about that for the, um, the least squared um, cost function. Right? Um, the same reason why we square them here uh, again. So, but, but again, we're, we're squaring the, um, the parameters themselves here, the theta parameters. Um, so by squaring them, we, we, we end up with the magnitude. Um, and that will mean that if we have, if these are, if these values are big for the theta parameters that we're fitting for our model, uh, that, that term will end up being big 
and that will make the cost be higher. Right? Um, so this will tend to try and drive um, the uh, like gradient descent or whatever the optimization method is. It will tend to drive it to try and find models that, that perform well on the, the, the mean squared error, uh, but that, that can perform just as well where the parameters are small or down towards zero, right? Uh, Um, and, and we can tweak how much penalty we use. So if, if alpha is zero, this term goes away. Uh, and, and, and in effect, um, alpha, if you make it zero, means we're not using regularization, right? But then you can use alpha, you know, whatever value above zero. It's, it has to be a positive value, but um, for a penalty. So, so alpha can be zero to some big positive number. The, the bigger you make it, the more you're going to penalize and the more you're going to um, tend to drive the parameters to try to be zero um, for the cost um, So we can see the effect of this. So we're doing the same thing that we did in the previous notebook. Um, so um, I believe, you know, again, we've got a quadratic function that we use. Um, I guess we changed it a little, I guess the same one still that we're using. Um, one half x squared plus three fourths of x plus three. Um, and we fit, um, in this case, we, we fit a model um, with um, a, um, what was it here? Um, we, we fit a model with, with a 25 degree polynomial. So we're trying to fit a 25 degree polynomial, but we're going to be uh, using um, some of this regularization, this ridge regularization, right? We use different different levels of rigor, rid, the ridge regularization. Here. So if alpha is zero, um, we're not using any regularization. So this is um, the, the, the blue line represents an overfit model again, because we're using a degree 25 polynomial. So we get a lot of wiggle. So, so it's kind of modeling the noise. And the data here, but um, if we if we set alpha to be really high, though, that will tend to try and drive all the parameters to be zero. So in that case, you get something almost like a line, right? So in that case, all the parameters go away, and you end up with with a line that's approximately what what the mean value is of of, of the y outputs when when you give too much regularization. Right? So again, this model isn't going to be too well either um, because now we're going to be underfitting if we regularize too much, right? But if you tune that just right, um, the, the orange one has a regularization alpha parameter of one. Um, so again, the dotted line is the true function. So we get something that's, that's doing pretty well, except for maybe at the ends here. Um, but it's, it's, sort of, it's doing better than the other two, right? Um, you can look at the resulting parameters. Um, so when alpha was one, um, that was the best one. So it didn't actually drive all the parameters to zero. Um, so uh, again, the first parameter, uh, the, the, the um, I mean, this is the intercept. Um, so the, the regularization is only going to affect the, um, um, the, the theta uh, one, two, and three. It's not going to affect the, uh, the theta zero parameter in this case. Right? Um, that, that might not, I shouldn't, shouldn't say that as if it's obvious. Um, so I, I kind of skipped over that. So the, the um, it's probably discussed in here, but um, if you look carefully at the summation of this, we just, we sum uh, for i is one to n, right? So that's going to be theta one, theta two, theta three, but we don't add in theta zero to this regularization penalty, right? So, so we're not um, penalizing the, uh, the, the the term for the uh, the bias term or the constant term. Only the other parameters for the um, you know the the the, the actual uh, features uh, of the data set here um, have, have the so, so, so we end up with, with three, um, and um, and you can see that a lot of these higher order terms. So, so this is going to be the, the term for the um, um, 
Yeah, this, this will be the uh, x to the power of one term, so, so the, the, the three fourths, and then the x squared, and then x cubed, and, and so on, um, I believe here, right? So, you know, about 0.5, and this is a little bit small. Um, well, this should have been 0.5, and then this should have been 0.75. Uh, but the ones after that, I mean, there's still some, the, there's still some terms, of, I mean, none of them got driven all the way to zero, but, but they are smaller in general. Um, these names maybe weren't good names. So the one, the, the ridge regression one was where we used an alpha of 100 here. So, so this, this drove it to be permissionally aligned. So if you look at the um, uh, parameters in that case, um, um, well, I mean, you know, so they're, they're, they're smaller um, than, than um, in the previous case, but, but still not completely zero. So. All right. Um, so I may have said this wrong here. That this this type of regularization goes by different names um, in in the machine learning. You know, they, they call this ridge regression for I can't remember why. Um, maybe the textbook discussed where the name ridge comes from. Um, in mathematics, um, so, so people doing like mathematical um, um, uh, like linear algebra, uh, there, there's something called an L2 norm, which is basically the same thing. So this is equivalent to doing an L2 norm on here, doing the, the, the square. So adding in the, the square of the, um, of the theta parameters into the cost function. Um, and we're doing, yeah. So the reason why we point this out is that um, somewhat inconsistently in scikit-learn, so some places, so, so um, you know, we use the actual object called ridge, um, do the this uh, ridge regression here um, from from scikit-learn in the first example, but a lot of of objects in um, Psychic learn will um, um, refer to this as a penalty term, a, regre um, a regularization penalty term. Um, and in that case, you'll have to specify it as L2 or L1. Okay. So if you use these, uh, a standard gradient descent regressor, um, this is actually doing the same least squared fit by default if we don't specify a different fitness function here. So we're doing the same thing as we did for the ridge and the linear regression, um, but in, we're doing the same thing for the ridge by specifying to do the L2. So that's the same as uh, ridge um, regression or, or that ridge regression penalty. You know. um, and you can specify the, the same um, alpha, you know, so give a parameter alpha to specify that you know, the amount of weight to give the uh, L2 penalty or the ridge regression penalty here. So, um, so um, I'm not certain why, I believe, I mean, if you use the same alpha um, on the same data here, um, You ought to get, let's see if this is true or not, but you ought to get about the same parameters that you'll get with using, you know, that same alpha um, with the ridge. Um, 3.058, yeah, so I guess not exactly the same. So there, there's some slight differences, um, but um, so there's probably some other, um, 
um, some other things we'd have to specify for the meta parameters here to, to, to so it was doing an exact same uh, model there. But anyway, um, um, the, they should be doing about the same thing there. But, um, um, So you can get a similar effect by using uh, lasso regressions. So this this is actually an acronym. I don't remember if ridge is an acronym or not, but you know, lasso is the least, least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. Um, so, but you know, again, we're, we're doing conceptually the same thing, but we're summing up the absolute values instead of the squares, right? So again, since the thetas can be positive or negative, to make this into a penalty that we add to our cost function, we need to do something so that we're we're getting the magnitude of those data parameters. So you can do that with the absolute value here. But the, the effect is slightly different. So, so the, the penalties end up doing um, um, slightly different things when you use them. Um, um, this is also known as an L1 norm, um, this, this lasso. Uh, so, so they have two kind of different properties. So in practical terms, what happens for the, the using this absolute value or the L1 norm um, is um, it has the effect of actually driving parameters to zero to try and eliminate them. So, so you can actually use L1 norm to do what's known as a, a feature selection. So determining which features uh, can maybe be dropped are least helpful to a model. So, so you'll see that used a lot, um, like, like use an L1 norm, um, um, set the alpha for the L1 norm to some particular high enough value so that you begin to see some features, their, their parameters get driven to zero, which means that they are contributing the least amount to being able to make a good model to reduce the, um, um, the cost for the cost function, right? Um, so you can see that happen here. So um, um, again, from scikit-learn, there's a function called um, called lasso um, to to um, um, do the L1 norm of this uh, lasso regression here. Um, and if we use different values of um, alpha, well, what are we using? So we're using an alpha essentially of zero, so, so no um, lasso regression, um, or um, an alpha of 0 0.01, or an alpha of one um, in these three. Um, examples here. So what you'll see, I mean, if you actually look at the, the values, like, like for the small one, that was the 0 0.01, right? I mean, it actually made a lot of the parameters zero. Um, um, and, um, that's particularly so. So, in general, when you're doing machine learning, uh, usually all the features you have in your data can be useful to the model. So, so normally you don't want to drop uh, uh, features, at least not immediately, right? But in this case, I mean, you know, we're, we're fitting a model to, to data that, that is truly quadratic, right? So, so, in that case, I mean, it, it is really useful to actually find the higher level polynomial features that are not useful to the model. So the L1 regression does really well, or the last regression does really well here, right? So again, um, you know, it was like 0.75 um, or, or 0.5 for the uh, X term and then 0.75 for the X squared term. Um, Five for the x squared plus n five for the x to the one. Um, 
So this was a bit low, but that's because, um, so what, what you'll see sometimes though, is that, uh, you know, so powers of two uh, will have similar effects. So, so really this was like X squared, uh, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh. So I've kept the X twelfth for some reason. So, so, but, but really kind of the combination of, of taking it to the twelfth power plus squaring it is getting us close to the 0.75, right? But, but we essentially dropped all but uh, those, you know, x to the one, x to the two, and x to the twelfth power here. Um, and and yeah, if your alpha is too high, you know, again, it'll tend to make it to, to align basically, but it'll really make it align for L1 regression. So you end up with everything zero um, and uh, only the bias term, which will end up being kind of the average um, of the values in there. All right, uh, and then an elastic net is really just um, a fancy name for uh, trying to do a model where you have both L1 and L2 regularization. So both the lasso and the ridge, right? But in that case, you have a parameter R um, and alpha. So alpha works the same way. Um, and I, I guess you use the same alpha for both of these to, to, to give some idea of how much or how little regularization you want. And again, if, if alpha is zero, both of these would just be zero and would go away. But then R allows you to balance between the two. So, so a high R will give you more of the uh, L1 uh, lasso. So this is, this is the absolute value. So that's the L1 lasso. Um, and uh, that shouldn't have been minus I, that should have been O uh, underscore I, or sorry, theta underscore I there. So, um, there's a mistake in the equation there. Um, there we go. Um, so yeah, I mean, R, if R is big, you'll get more of this and less of the L2 uh, ridge regularization. And if R is small, um, you know, one my small will make this big, you'll get more of this and less of that. So. So yeah, when R is zero, um, you're, you're essentially reduced down to the um, ridge regression. And when R is one, this term goes away and, and you're essentially just doing um, the, the lasso regression. In practice, I don't know, I, I don't find, you know, doing combinations of these, too useful, um, a lot. But um, I think in our assignment, I asked you to try out, you know, an elastic net, so a combination of the L1 and L2 regularization. So in this case, we're using both L1 and L2 uh, equally. So the L1 ratio is that R that we were just talking about. And then the alpha um, is applied to both of these. Um, you see, in this case, it tended to drive all of the um, odd powered ones, so it mostly only the even powered, because again, this is an x squared, and that kind of makes sense. So, um, and so it did keep the x cubed term. So, no, I guess that's wrong. So yeah, it was actually some of the, the um, odd terms there. So I'm not, not sure exactly why that was. It was a little bit counterintuitive to me, but um, anyway. All right. Um, so let's look at the third assignment here then. See if anybody had any questions about that. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, this assignment is, is um, basically asking you to do um, all the stuff that we were just talking about. So, so, so it's important to, to really understand the materials here and the uh, 
the 4-3 and the 4-4, because, I mean, I ask you to basically do the same thing, but on an unknown polynomial function, okay? So the, um, um, the data that I gave you is in the assignment three data.csv. Um, so it's again, just a, um, um, it's got a single feature X and then Y is the, um, 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 the label or the, the regression value that we're trying to predict from the X here. But in this case, I generated it with um, a, um, 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 a higher than, than a degree two polynomial. Um, so I, I generated the, the Y output. Um, so this is some nonlinear polynomial function of, of X, X squared, X cubed, uh, X to the fourth, X to the fifth. Um, I'm, oops, I'm sure I... Um, Yeah, it's, it's somewhere between like a degree three and a degree 15 um, polynomial. So I'm kind of, I'm, in this assignment, I'm trying to get you to uh, kind of use what you learn um, in these past two weeks to try and fit a polynomial regression and use some regularization and see if you can figure out, you know, you won't be able to get it exact because there is there is noise in there, um, but, but see if you can get a good determination on what degree this polynomial is uh, in the data that, that we gave you. And then, you know, um, so, so estimate the, the degree and fit a model to it. So, so get good estimates then for the uh, theta parameters um, uh, for, for the polynomial. Um, So you should start by you know loading it and and, and plotting, give, give a scatter plot of the data, take a look, see what it looks like. Um, yeah, and in the first one, I ask you to you know fit a degree twenty polynomial, um, so which should be overfitting the data um, a bit. So, you know, use the stuff for the notebooks to, 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 to create um, an array X that has the, you know, uh, the, the, the combinations of, of X, uh, X squared, X cubed up to X to the power of 20, so degree 20 polynomial, um, and fit uh, using regular linear regression scikit learn object here. Um, and then, you know, pull out the intercept and the coefficients um, and, and plot the fit that you get um, for the data there. And so again, whenever you plot data like this, you should plot the raw data point as a scatter plot. Um, and um, then you should um, also plot the, um, uh, the the fit as a line plot. So when, when you have data that has noise, you know, so this represents the raw data and you should always plot those as scatter plots uh, of data to, to kind of see the variation and things. But when you fit a model, the, the model has an exact estimate of the parameters um, you know, for the different um, uh, features of the model that you're um, uh, fitting toward, right? Well, in that case though, you should all, your, your model, your representation of your model should always end up as some line on your plot, um, um, you know, against, and usually it should be uh, a line um, plotted against the scatter plot of the, the actual data points that your model is being fit to as we did in all these examples for these notebooks here, right? Then a third thing you'll often have on models like this when you're doing a regression model is some sort of error bars, you know, some, some sort of information about a confidence interval of, of, of where the parameters might range on those. Um, but I don't think we do that on this assignment. Um, And then in part three, um, um, I ask you to 
plot a learning curve for the degree 20 model. So we'll be taking the same model, um, but um, I gave you a function, uh, which is probably the same function that we used um, in the uh, lecture notebook um, uh, for plotting these kinds of learning curves. Right? So whenever you call this function, you know, you have to pass in the, the model that you create, you know, like your linear regression model um, and your inputs and your outputs. Um, and it will, you know, fit models using one, two, three up to n data points uh, to plot the learning curves here for you. Um, Oh, but yeah, like like I showed in the uh, the, the le lecture notebooks, um, I mean, you can pass in just a regular linear regression, for example. Uh, but um, uh, like we did for the regularization models. Um, Uh, what you'll want to do instead is pass in, create a pipeline, you know, so that will, so you can pass in the, the raw data X, um, and then it will actually put it through this pipeline to create the polynomial features of the, of the desired, um, you know, degree for the polynomial first, uh, and then do, you know, you should be probably using linear regression instead of SGD regression um, for these pipelines. There's examples of, of uh, those things in here, right? So be using linear regression and then later on like ridge um, and lasso and um, um, I believe also the um, um, combination of two, the elastic net. Um, So as we've already hinted, um, you know, this first one should be overfitting. So, so hopefully you'll see evidence when you plot the um, uh, learning curve similar to the example of overfitting um, in our um, uh, lecture notebook and in our textbook example. But another useful thing about this is, you know, like, like we talked about, um, this will give you a little bit of an idea though, of maybe what RMSE performance you should see. So if you look at the performance um, on, the, um, on the data that you trained with, um, when you're overfitting like this, uh, this gives you an idea of what kind of RMSE you, you might be able to achieve, you should be able to achieve uh, when you have a good model that's, that's not underfitting, but that's, you know, just right in terms of your model power, the degree of the polynomial and things. Um, and then, yeah, I guess we jump right to ridge regression. Um, I don't know, so, so, you know, we ask you to kind of do ridge regression and lasso regression. So again, since you already know that this is a, a degree 20 polynomial, this one will probably be the most useful because like we just talked about, this one is using the L1 or the lasso regularization. Um, so it will tend to drive down the parameters that aren't useful, um, you know, that, that, that are um, um, bigger than the actual polynomial degrees that were used to generate this, this data that you were given here, right? But, you know, it won't be guaranteed because you will have to, um, you know, I don't, I don't tell you what alpha value will make a good value here. So you'll have to try some different values of, of alpha um, when you're applying regularization, both the ridge and the lasso, um, to get a feel for um, and, and, and see if you can um, find something that looks like it might be performing well here for you. Um, so 
So yeah, and the final thing I ask you to, you know, kind of take this, the, this, this is kind of an example of doing um, uh, model exploration and model tuning here, you know, um, uh, where you're creating some models and trying out some different values for different types of regularization and different values of alpha for your regularization here. So, 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 so take that and try and figure out what you think might be the true, true degree of the polynomial um, and use that to build a model. Um, and, you know, you can try and train it without any regularization. So, you know, if, if you pick a, a, a pretty close to the correct degree, uh, in theory, you don't need a lot of regularization, but, but you might also want to try shooting for, you know, maybe a little bit bigger than what the, the true degree of the, the, the model um, is, but still keep around some um, regularization. In this case, you might want to use L2 regularization because uh, if, if your model is, is close to the true nature of the underlying thing that's, that's creating the data, you probably want to keep all the features in case um, in case you actually pick something that's a little bit too underpowered um, and then yeah apply a little bit of regularization to, to try and tune that a bit and then yeah i mean on all these i'm asking you to you know kind of display certain information about your fit um, and on this final one to actually visualize the model that you fit to the data. Um, okay. Um, all right, so yeah, that's, that's, um, I think everything about the fourth assignment. This is kind of an important assignment. Um, I don't don't think. Um, well, um, I mean, this will definitely take you more time than the last one, I believe, for most people. But um, um, hopefully, not too much. Um, um, it is pretty similar to the the work in the the the, the four dash three and the four dash four uh, lecture notebooks and lecture videos. So just on an unknown um, set of data with, with an unknown um, polynomial that's driving the generation of the data there. Okay, um, does anybody kind of ask, ask any questions about that? No, less chance. I mean, of course, you know, as usual, keep sending questions by email um, as you're working on this stuff. I probably want to do get started on this um, like today or tomorrow if you haven't started on it yet. So at least begin looking at it. Make sure that you understand what you're doing so you can have enough time to send me questions and things. So. All right. Um, well, um, I'll go ahead and... Um, in our session then, um, and I'll get this video posted for those that um, um, are watching these asynchronously. Um, and um, yep, and that's it. And I'll see you guys later then.